freaking track meet out there. Yeah. Welcome. Welcome to the show, kid. To track down Tyreek Hill. Wow. I'm not sure how much shit you'd be on Tyreek Hill. Probably one on one all game. <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> I'll take it over Edmonds. Uh, gotcha, bitch. <laughs> okay, so like I said in an earlier video that's only available to patrons now because I'm trying to get that famous wealthy YouTube money after all, policing in America is a cult. And no, I'm not going to waste time explaining why, because most of y'all are smart enough to already know this. And the rest of y'all have probably already made up your minds to the contrary, because you, in fact, are a part of the civilian cult of personality that has formed around policing. If y'all do want to know the nitty gritty details on how cults actually work, John Lewis did a whole video about it that y'all should actually go watch i'll drop it in the description but my point in pointing that out is because police culture is so egregiously lacking in transparency to the communities it's supposed to be protecting and no one really sees a problem with this except the people most impacted by that lack of transparency i.e the most marginalized among us that institution is basically bulletproof in the court of public opinion, that is. No pun intended. Actually, I take that back, pun definitely intended. Thus, any legitimate attempts at reform are basically DOA, just like jiggle physics. Okay, so real talk story time now, right? At the height of George Floyd fever, I and a couple fellow minister friends of mine formed a coalition specifically to push for such reforms. Among them diverting all that funding that goes to state police salaries every year to public works and infrastructure in the communities in which we live and worship. We requested meetings with literally every state senator and assembly person in the state and we got a grand total of two responses and only one sit down meeting that was never even followed up on. And to date, the only reforms that I can recall ever coming out of the summer of Floyd, at least in Jersey, are all procedural, like implicit bias training and the banning of certain restraining tactics, but nothing truly game changing. Like, oh, I don't know, maybe banning qualified immunity outright or cracking down on all the lateral transfers between jurisdictions in order to avoid disciplinary action. Something that would actually matter. Now, to be fair, the New Jersey Supreme Court did make it harder to qualify one's immunity by denying officers the right to appeal going to trial in the first place. But that's just one less hurdle the victim has to get over before having the whole of that state's justice system throw practically every resource they can behind a couple of C minus community college dropouts who only decided to join the force after their esports commentary channel cratered due to Nintendo's copyright policy. And again, this was right at the height of the summer of Floyd when the whole world began to actually care slightly about black people for approximately like three months. Well, okay, we'll, we'll call it four for niceties sake. Before they wound up remembering how depressed they were that Olive Garden was still closed due to the airborne AIDS epidemic. We ain't ever going to get that kind of mass scrutiny placed on policing again until another public lynching goes viral. Maybe. Probably not, but maybe. The white folks said y'all get one summer of solidarity before we all go back to being colorblind in our 10 year old mctown homes with the gentrified font house numbers and the tour the chalk is always special locked up in the bike park outside of it anyway my point is the only thing america loves more than police is pickneys 
if you still have it because you're like me and are actually internally 20 years older than your physical age turn on basic cable and tell me how many cop shows you find like when i was growing up there were at least like 20 different law and order spinoffs and they were all garbage except criminal intent i'm not going to cap that one slap because it was basically just batman but if he were broke my point is american pop culture is basically characterized by copaganda in one way or another to the point that most of us myself included don't even recognize it unless we've actively conditioned ourselves to spot it the same way white yuppies are conditioned to spot the perfect location for the new neighborhood dog park which just so happens to be the abandoned row home where miss pearlie's grandson od'd solidarity so when i say things like american policing is fundamentally anti-black anti-queer anti-poor anti-immigrant basically anti anything that's not cis at white american male therefore the best possible outcome for marginalized people is for policing as a state-funded institution be abolished i get the same kind of reaction that seeing john morant trending again would get this, this, this is the reaction, if you know. But then I pull out my obligatory more cops actually does more harm to communities of color stats. And the people's eyes get bigger than mine when I see Janelle Monet is trending again. Just in case you didn't know. But we'll get to that part a little bit later on. For now, what I want to talk about is something that most of my... <coughs> <coughs> it's the feds! trying to kill me for now what i want to talk about is something that most of my melanated audience members probably already know but just don't have the qualitative or quantitative evidence to back it up and what the vote blue no matter who brigade refuses to acknowledge because they're too busy making excuses to be crafted for doing jack sh shite with a two-year trifecta of federal control just in time for the polls to open. And that's that from the very beginning, American policing has been little more than an agent for state-sponsored terrorism and counter-revolution. Yeah, I'm going to need somebody to come check on me after this gets uploaded. Y'all, I'm serious. They use force to make you do what the deciders have decided you must do. But the point is that that in the South, rich whites were hiring poor whites to police their property, which was enslaved Africans. And that forms a sort of a, both a material and immaterial relationship, a, a bond that is 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 uh, in play today. And in the North, it was mostly the same thing where rich whites hired poor whites to protect the property interests of the ruling elite, which was, of course, formed in the north in the in the guise of corporations and and the business community factories, etc. So uh, 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 the police were initially there to to break up unions and to, to suppress labor, which in most cases was white. But in each case, there was this this initial relationship that that forms in this society that guarantees that uh, uh, the police are, are here again, just to function to protect the, the interests of the ruling elite, or as Daruba bin Wahad says, they are the armed wing of the ruling elite. So- Yeah, I always think, so, I always tell people, I think they do, they do uh, the movement has done a disservice in general. Any movement has done a disservice when you paint it to people like their support is a favor. Like you, you want them to care about an issue that is unrelated to them or worse, you know, we present it as though they're benefited from these systems, um, that they're benefited from these systems and these systems only harm us. And so we want them out mm -hmm. of the goodness of their heart to join to join forces with us. When in reality, policing, a police state is everyone's problem. That's why when, when people say, you know, and they think that they are rebutting your arguments about racism and police brutality and they say, well, police kill white people too or they kill white more white people and i'm like yes yeah and that is a problem it's, that is a police it, state yeah. too. money property you know i mean the uh ceos and stockholders are the people who they only people they protect when it comes to police they're not even here to protect us like they uh, like a rhetoric spits it's more just about protecting property and really the capitalist class 
Okay, so I know the first thing a lot of y'all expect me to talk about is how American policing's origins lie in the South Carolina slave catcher tradition, but that's only half true. See, that truth is only applicable in the South because policing in America is unique from most other first, second, and even third world nations and that it is highly, highly, highly decentralized. Part of the reason why police reform is practically impossible in the states is because there are way too many departments with their own rules, training regimens, disciplinary procedures, etc. Whereas in a country like Germany, there's at least standardized requirements for hiring as well as training. But again, I'm trying to stay on task here, unlike the police. My point is American policing, like most things American, doesn't have any one origin story, just like the Joker and also SZA. But we can point to the slave catching tradition as the primary inspiration for a model of early police departments in the American South. Now in the North, the story is a little more complicated like scissors. See, policing in the colonial period was inspired primarily by the English common law tradition of the old world. Basically, what you had was a network of citizen volunteers who were overseen and mobilized by either a volunteer town sheriff or a crown appointed constable many times who were <laughs> criminals themselves and the honor that they were being given was actually a form of punishment who would officially be in charge of prosecuting those criminals. So yeah, basically, this is the same thing police abolitionists have been pushing as an alternative for basically ever now. But again, we'll kind of sort of talk about that later. The first instance we have in the U.S. of a municipally funded police force was the Rattle Watch of New Amsterdam, who started getting paid for their service in 1658. The difference between them and modern police, however, is that these cops were basically just night watchmen, but round the clock. They didn't really use force as far as I could gather, but they would shake their namesake rattles or even jangle a chain of keys in order to deter happened upon would-be criminal activity. They were basically Craig and Day Day and Friday after next is, is, is what I'm saying. We top flight security of the world, Craig. Shit. And by the time the English had captured New Amsterdam, the English common law tradition that I mentioned earlier was the policing method of choice there. It isn't until 1785 that we get something that kind of looks like modern police if you squint hard enough down in, what and you know it, Charleston, South Carolina. Now, it would be really easy for me to withhold vital information here for the sake of making my point. But no, that's not really where modern policing comes from. So if you know anything about the Industrial Revolution, then you know about the Gilded Age and the robber barons that have become associated with it. If you don't know, then just know that people were singing these scary behind lullabies to their kids about J.D. Rockefeller coming in the night to drag them off to hell or something like he was Slenderman. That's how much niggas hated billionaires back then. Something we probably really need to get back to, honestly. You also know that during this period, the states got a huge influx of immigrants, most of whom came from the British Isles. Most of whom came because they were poor and destitute in the British Isles. So what's a rich dickhead to do with all of these poor and foreign folks skulking around the shipyards where their precious sugar and sandwich bread shipments are? Hire a private army to protect it. Duh, nigga. So that's what they did until a couple of those dickheads up in Boston decided, you know what, the cost of these security goons is really cutting into my mustache wax budget. Hey, you know what we should do? Make the poor bastards pay for their own harassment. And thus the first organized and publicly funded police department in the U.S. was established in Boston in 1838, thanks in large part to lobbying from that city's class of elites. And y'all wonder why I hate the Celtics so much. 
and because rich people are nothing if not prone to mimicry. Philadelphia did the same in 1844, and New York a full decade after Philly. So here's where the slave catcher connection really comes in, folks. When slavery technically ended after the war, the slave catcher patrols in the South were forced to disband. Tragic, I know. But because dickheaded people who are that committed to their dickheadry usually don't just go F off home when their initial vehicle goes bust, all those poor white trash a-holes pivoted to one of either and many times, if not most times, two nascent institutions. The police and the Klan. And so, yeah, they brought a lot of the slave catching tactics that they used back then to both their new employer and the white sheets. And because again, American policing is so decentralized and proud of it at that, nothing was ever really done to address that, which is why you now have this. Yes, yeah, actually more than just a meme, folks. So what I'm saying is, Modern American policing is basically just the Wild West, which is actually pretty appropriate if you know the history of policing in the West. So you know that rugged individualism that defines both Old West mythology and loose cannon propaganda films? Well, that attitude was no more evident than in the way policing was handled then and there. See, frontier dwellers didn't follow the trend of their big city cousins out east in adopting an organized, publicly funded police force due to concerns over corruption, lack of civilian oversight, and the fear of rich people basically just using the cops as a private army. So yeah, what they feared was modern policing is what I'm saying. That said... The gift and the curse of the posse system y'all have come to know and love from Western themed media is again, because of the nature of life and crime in the West, lawmen most times were less benevolent volunteers than they were opportunistic vigilantes. So yeah, just like modern policing is what I'm saying. In addition to using their authority to exercise old grudges, because like today, most crimes in the Old West were against property and not really against people, Old West lawmen would prioritize recovering the stolen property over actually apprehending the offender. Which I mean, sounds good in practice until you learn that the reason they did that was because life and the law had a much more small town feel to it. It was usually the same handful of people rustling everybody else's cattle. Once you know that, then you start to see the hustle a little more clearly, right? And then, once the railroads got involved, they started offering Buku Bank to apprehend stick-up artists of all kinds, dead or alive. Yeah, still, still not ashamed. Thus, effectively eliminating any semblance of due process in the West. Because if you've ever played a Western-themed game like Red Dead... Why would I go through the hassle of chasing and hog tying a dude when I can just cap him in the back of the head and be done with it for the same reward? Duh, nigga. This is real life, buckos. There is no honor system after all. Which kind of explains the police. But that being said, because law enforcement in the West was so well <laughs> lawless and thus ineffective, the railroads and stagecoach companies started hiring you guessed it, private armies. In the form of the Rocky Mountain Detective Agency and its much more notorious and ghetto cousin, the Pinkertons. So for those of y'all who didn't play Red Dead Redemption 2, the Pinkertons are the primary antagonists in that game, unless you want to count that suck fucking red dick Micah. And for those of y'all who did play the game, the way the pinks are depicted there is actually pretty historically accurate, if I'm going to be honest down to the way they actually caught their quarry. So big spoiler warning here for a five-year-old game, but for y'all that don't know, in the penultimate mission of the game, that suck fucking rat dick Micah is revealed to have been feeding intel to the pinks at least since the game came back to the States after inciting a slave rebellion in the Caribbean before blowing up a Spanish turtle ship with a single howitzer cannon. Yeah, yeah, this is why it's game of the decade, man. Thus, why the pinks seem to always be within like a beaver's butt hair away from the Vanderling gang wherever they went after chapter five. Matter of fact, some people theorize that that suck 
fucking rat dick Micah wasn't the real snitch after all, even though yeah he actually was but that there was at least one other person playing mole from jump now again i don't want to get too off topic here but my point is one of the main tactics the pinkertons used to catch their bounties was intel gathering through informants and undercover agents in addition to what was at the time cutting edge investigative tools like handwriting and fingerprint analysis now, before we do put the pieces of this story together, we have to backtrack to 1860 when the Pinkertons were contracted by the U.S. government to safely deliver newly elected President Philly Beard to the Capitol. Matter of fact, the founder of the agency, Alan Pinkerton, got famous by claiming he had uncovered and foiled an assassination attempt against Lincoln in 1861. Yeah, too bad he couldn't catch lightning in a bottle twice, huh? So anyway, from that point on, Lincoln contracted the Pinks to both act as his personal bodyguard and to snoop on the Rebs. The methods they used to do so laid the groundwork for what the Secret Service would wind up doing once it went from just being a counter counterfeit measure to the president's personal bodyguard. Matter of fact, remember how I said the Pinkertons were the stagecoach and railway companies, armies of choice, and that's the reason why the Pinks became so prominent in Old West lore? Well, truth be told, the Pinks were actually a bigger deal out East because all that clout they gained from keeping Abe's head off of a platter and the rebels in the L column led to the robber barons I mentioned earlier contracting the pinks as their private army of choice matter of fact the 1870s and 80s is when the pinkertons reached the height of their powers in america mainly through union busting by using the same exact tactics they did during the war against day laborers now which is why to this day the name pinkerton is synonymous with anti-labor activity it wasn't until the Homestead Strike of 1892 that I'm not going to waste time explaining because Google is right there. Matter of fact, a library that public opinion swung against the Pinks and it never swung back. So much so that in 1893, Congress passed the Anti-Pinkerton Act, which, among other things, made it illegal for the feds to contract the Pinks for any government business. But I mean, the feds is the feds after all. Did you really think that they would just give up harassing poor folks that easily? Well, if you did, I have a bridge to sell you, and it's called Steve Harvey's Dating Advice. Upon the 1901 assassination of William McKinley, Teddy Big Tooth Roosevelt got a sudden hard on for anarchist, undermining the government. Or more likely, he just used the anarchist excuse to make sure he wouldn't get clapped the same way his predecessor did. Since at least 1896, the feds had been surveilling suspected enemies of the state and keeping record of their activities. But this evidently wasn't good enough for Teddy, who ordered the attorney general at the time, Charles Bonaparte, no relation, to organize an investigative bureau that would report directly and exclusively to the AG. But instead, Bonaparte spent the next few years dragging his feet and trying to rope in other agencies like the Secret Service to use their personnel until in 1908, Congress basically said, no, no, bro, it don't, it don't work like that. What, what you thought, it was sweet over here? Thus, on July 26, 1908, Bonaparte hired 34 personnel, some of whom were retired Secret Service agents, to start what would become the Bureau of Investigation which through a bunch of mergers and rechristenings throughout the next two decades that I'm not going to get into, would become the Federal Bureau of Investigation in 1935. Now, remember how I said way back that the Pinkertons were basically the inspiration behind the Secret Service as it's come to be known today? Also, remember how I said even earlier than that, that the slave catchers just carried their old tactics with them to a new employer and nobody really said anything about it? So, yeah, the FBI, practically speaking, is the modern version of what the Pinkertons were in the 19th century, a private army dedicated to domestic espionage and subterfuge for the purpose of ensuring that commerce operates as undisturbed as possible. Why do you think most of the crimes that the FBI investigates and prosecutes are white-collar variety? 
The point I'm making is basically every law enforcement agency in the U.S. was created to make rich people even bigger dickheads than they already are. And that's especially true of the TSA. Further, by the early 20th century, that role expanded to protecting the interests of the state from domestic threats. Point being, neither one of those things has any inherent connection to protecting and serving the public. So yeah, Law and Order is a pretty accurate title for a copaganda program is what I'm saying. Because you see, here's the thing about the law. It's not necessarily just, and it doesn't have to be. It changes all the time depending on the zeitgeist. And honestly, more often than that, the interest of the state. For example, if not for loving the Virginia, I would not legally be able to smash a white woman. And Zoe Zaldana would still be single probably but my point is because laws change so does the definition of a crime like prohibition basically created organized crime as we know it today actually it literally created organized crime as we know it today and thanks to policies created during the bush and obama administrations your browser history is now fair game for the feds and so is your youth pastors and by the way don't bother going to sunday school this Sunday. I've got some pretty accurate intel on that. Point being that the phrase justice system is a misnomer. Said system is only really meant to ensure that commerce is able to operate undeterred, which is why things like vagrancy and loitering laws exist in some capacity in most states. Now, I am willing to concede that police can act as a deterrent to certain crimes in certain areas but that's all dependent on what crimes we're talking about and what areas in which they're being committed but where those crimes are being committed is exactly why the impact of policing on the people who are most vulnerable to crime in the first place is a net negative All of the places they like to they like to highlight because they like to dog because it, it's a dog whistle, right? Choose New York City, choose Chicago, choose LA, choose places where there are black people, right? To make out mm-hmm. to be oh these big beds of crime. All of those places, New York City spends more than eleven billion dollars on policing. Yeah. We spend more money on policing than anywhere. So how is that not a reflection of the fact that mass incarceration does not work? When we think about that, we gotta go through history, right? And we think from foundation of the police of the prison system as we know it um there and just slavery as a whole because the prison system is a slavery thing and the police are uh the slave catchers right so when we go back to it i think that rhetoric is so embedded with inside u.s culture like from foundation right that was how they dehumanize the slaves and kept them as that we were like the danger to white women or we were just dangerous people uh just in general that these animals need to be controlled and i think that rhetoric roots the very foundations of America, of policing, of prisons. And you can't really like separate any of those from that. And even when you think about police, a lot of that rhetoric um, uh, uh, comes from the same place as the police do, which was the Klan, um, which was the, the slave patrols. And so when we see it, they still are able to utilize that. The thing that's always pissed me off about the way that white people, the conservative ones specifically, talk about crime is nine times out of ten, the type of crime they're weeping and gnashing teeth over doesn't even impact them directly until their daughters start dating black guys. More often than not, they're talking about violent crime, specifically gun crime, and even more specifically, homicides, or at least attempts at homicides, which with full transparency, black people are grossly overrepresented in that category, even when adjusting to consider the wealth gap contributions to the likelihood of criminality. However, homicides are almost always a result of interpersonal beef that escalated way beyond what was reasonable before anyone had any sense to say, you know, how about we just go take a token, chill the F out. You know, that is to say, unless you're a street nigga or you know a street nigga well enough to either have beef or very close interpersonal relation with them, you're pretty much safe and sound in your gated cul-de-sac, Ethan. That is, unless your new surrogate son-in-law brings the homies over for the gender reveal, of course. 
Furthermore, despite how violent a country this is compared to other first world nations, homicides account for a fraction of a percent of the total crime rate in the U.S. In fact, according to the Pew Research Center and the CDC, there are more gun-related self-unalivings than homicides every single year in the U.S. And some of y'all might be saying, well, that's because the boys and girls in blue are doing their job, isn't it? Well, actually, no. No, it's not bucko. Let me explain. So there have been studies done that show that an increased police presence in communities of color does not decrease the homicide rate in those communities. In fact, over policing of those communities, if nothing else, increases the arrest rate for nonviolent offenses like drug possession and prostitution. And because of laws like the 96 Personal Responsibility Act, and yes, that's actually what it's called, many ex-offenders are rendered ineligible for public aid like SNAP and TANF, thus perpetuating the vicious cycle. And no, I'm not going to tell you what those acronyms stand for, because if you are one of those people crying about crime rates, but you don't know what those acronyms mean, then you're not only part of the problem, but likely a racist jerk off who's indignant enough to crow about how you're not going to take it anymore, but too pussy to actually say what it is. It being shorthand for non-white or non cisset people making the public toilet seat warm for you. Pussy. And this is what I keep coming back to, folks. Policing is literally not designed to do anything but ensure that the day-to-day -day operations of commerce and state run smooth as silk. Even matter of fact, especially if that means poor people have to suffer as a result. This is the reason why arresting officers often lie on their reports, especially when they fail to follow proper procedure during search and arrest. This is why more often than you'd believe, Miranda rights are never read during an arrest, a practice that's barely only 60 years old at that. This is why cops will often try to intimidate or coerce a suspect into a confession before they even have a chance to speak to a lawyer, even when they know the suspect is probably not guilty. Policing is above all else a job than it is anything movies, TV, and your police captain uncle has convinced you it is. They have quotas, they have deadlines, just like the rest of us. And just like the rest of us, they're nowhere near above bending their own already lenient rules to meet those quotas. Protect and serve is a slogan. That is a, that is quite literally right. American propaganda. And that was that was propaganda. The police, policing didn't even that's not even it's funny how America gives us these slogans and we hold on to them as though they are like these like maxims ordained by God somewhere or written in stone and somewhere. But nowhere do you see policing where that is actually protect and serve mm -hmm. is not the agenda that actually was born out of a response to the Black Panther, uh, the Black Panthers, actually what the Black Panthers were doing. And that's when they came up with protect and serve when the Black Panthers were adopting that kind of language and encouraging, encouraging mm -hmm. self-defense. So that's that's how that was that was because I live in I live in Flatbush in Brooklyn where police are on every single yeah. block. You see police mm -hmm. constantly and they are not there to help us. In fact, you look and you watch and they're watching us. They are policing us, mm -hmm. the citizens. And it's funny. It's like they're thought of by white people in the populace that demand knacks for all these polices because, oh, they see the police as protecting their interests by policing us, you know, and, and being in our neighborhoods. And they are they are there to protect property. And you see that, right? You see the police, mm -hmm. they're posted outside of what they view as the valuable stores. They are there to respond to the concerns and the interests of, of the rich. But having grown up in 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 uh, suburban Section 8 and then gone also to some elite schools myself, nobody does drugs like rich white people. Nobody. It's not even close. But all the surveillance is in some other yep. part of society. So... And if the rich white kid can get caught and go to rehab and the poor black kid gets caught and goes to juvie or worse, that's where, you know, so really ultimately it's what what, what Dr. King used to say, that the, that what we call crime or what he said were derivative crimes of white supremacy and capitalism, that, that if you get rid of all of that, uh, to the extent you get rid of all of that, you get rid of crime. I mean, it would be really easy and accurate, honestly, for me to just chalk it up to white people doing white people things. But it is a 
bit deeper than that. See, remember how I said the police's job is not actually to protect and serve the public's interests, but to maintain law and order even at the expense of the public? Well, according to the Supreme Court, that's not just me whistling Dixie for the sake of contrarianism. On the morning of March 16, 1975, Carolyn Warren, Joan Talaferro, and Miriam Douglas were all awoken out of their sleep when two men, later identified as Marvin Kent and James Morse, broke into the home and into the second floor room where Douglas was asleep with her daughter and raped her. Warren and Telefero heard the screams from their third floor room, which they shared, and called 911 reporting a burglary. The dispatcher called the incident in as a code two, thus the incident was not given priority as an ongoing crime. Three officers were called to the scene while a fourth went to investigate a possible suspect nearby. Warren and Talaferro crawled to their window to await the police and observed the police cruiser riding past the front door of the residence without ever stopping. Followed a few minutes later by a second officer who at least got out the car but left the scene soon after knocking on the door and not receiving an answer. They continued hearing Douglas scream and called the police again, this time requesting immediate assistance. They were assured that an officer was en route. However, this time, dispatch never even sent out a call. The two women, assuming the cops were already in the house, called down to Douglas, at which point Kent and Morse went upstairs and forced the two women at knife point to go to the second floor room where Douglas and her daughter still were. The three women then spent the next 14 hours being raped, beaten, and forced to commit sex acts with one another before ultimately being robbed by the two assailants. This incident resulted in three separate suits being filed by each of the women against the D.C. Metro Police alleging negligence because, I mean, duh. The trial judges ruled that the officers held no legal duty to provide individual protection to any of the three women and dismissed the complaints. However, an appeals court did reverse the decision in Warren and Talaferro's cases because they actually did call the cops to investigate a crime scene after all, which they didn't. But they did not reverse the decision in Douglas's case because, again, she wasn't the one who dialed 911, thus setting the precedent that cops do not owe a duty to perform police services to specific citizens and that the, quote, duty to rescue only applies to, quote, special relationships. Basically, what I'm saying here is if your life is in danger, but you're not the one specifically asking for help from the police, you're basically boned. This precedent was further entrenched by the ruling in Deshaney versus Winnebago County. Yes, that is an actual county in which the court ruled that the state was free of any wrongdoing by not removing a child from an abusive home, despite multiple police and social services reports of abuse in that house that only resulted in more social workers being sent out in the majority opinion on the six to three decision it stated that it was only the state's duty to protect an individual if and when that individual was already in the custody of the state this is the precedent that was followed in 2005 in the case of castle rock versus gonzalez in which the court ruled that the police again had no duty to intervene or arrest the assailant this time despite a protective order already being in place against said assailant. In 2014, in the case of Lozito versus New York City, the plaintiff filed their suit after learning from a grand jury member, allegedly, that the attending officer testified that he was literally just too much of a pussy to intervene while Lozito was being slashed nearly to death. And this is the weird thing about cops being pussies. It's by no means an isolated thing. We all remember Uvalde, but what about Scott Peterson, the sheriff who literally ran from the scene as 14 kids were murdered at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School? 
or the dash cam footage from last year of a Detroit officer fleeing the scene of a shooting. And these are just incidents we know about. What about all the unreported incidents of police withholding or even actively lying about their role in incidents where lives could have been saved? The point I'm getting at here is that cops are not heroes. And the reason they're not is because they're not trained to be. Because they were never meant to be. And honestly, listen, I know this just sounds like I'm dumping on the pigs for being pigs and I'm going to keep it a buck. There is a part of me that is, but that's because I've seen for myself how little the police actually do to protect people like me and even go out of their way to do us harm. I said in an earlier video that I've never advocated for abolition because I've seen firsthand how police presence can act as a deterrent in impoverished neighborhoods. Or at least that's what I thought I saw. Or better yet, that's what I was taught to see. In fact, what I was actually seeing was the systemic oppression of my impoverished neighborhood through over-policing. What I didn't know is that most of the people that I saw being stopped and or questioned by the cops were already in the system. And more often than not, that was the only reason that they were being stopped in the first place. Like literally niggas just chilling on the corner, 12 pulls up and they just so happen to find a dime on the person's person with no prior suspicions on them that they might be doing something illegal. Like I said, cops have quotas too. And that's why the last week of about every month, niggas who knew better didn't stay outside for too long because they knew that that unmarked Crown Vic with the pitch black rims would be rolling around the block until the first. Okay, so I do realize that I've spent a lot of time here talking exclusively about police and why they're a problem, but honestly, it would be dishonest for me to just sit here and pretend like the reason cops are an issue is just because they're all inherently bad people and yeah a lot and i mean a lot of people in law enforcement are just straight up dickheads and douche nozzles with either an unfulfilled power fantasy a crippling case of small dick syndrome or some combination of those two things but i think that reducing the problem to just all cops are bastards is kind of not a solution to the real issue here like not at all and i'll try to explain why later what i want y'all to understand is that u.s policing is nothing more than a symptom of a bigger issue it is the product of an even bigger more insidious problem a problem that goes beyond a bunch of problematic individuals hiding their problematicness behind an otherwise neutral profession. You know, at the same time, the military and the police, as I started off with, with the history of these institutions, themselves cull much of their population from the most oppressed communities. So having served in the military myself, I saw it firsthand, but, it, but it's pretty clear in the data the people you meet at the bottom rungs of the military are from the bottom rungs of society, mm -hmm. white, black, and other. Along with a number of scholar activists, as well as the mothers of some of California's incarcerated, Ruth Wilson Gilmore details in Golden Gulag how the California prison system became so expansive so rapidly, but more importantly, how and why, and the implication for people of color. TLDR, but jokes aside, y'all really should go R after watching this. After the post-war economic boom, California, like most other industrial-based states, struggled to pivot into the now service-based economy the U.S. was becoming. So again, like most industrial states, California leaned on construction for some quick cash. Specifically, the construction of prisons. The issue is most people weren't and still aren't willing to fork over their tax dollars unless you can justify the thing you're spending that money on. Enter the super predator narrative. We're making some progress. 
Much of it is related to the initiative called community policing because we have finally gotten more police officers on the street. That was one of the goals that the president had when he pushed the crime bill that was passed in 1994. He promised 100,000 police. We're moving in that direction, but we can see it already makes a difference because if we have more police interacting with people, having them on the streets, we can prevent crimes. We can prevent petty crimes from turning into something worse. But we also have to have an organized effort against gangs. Just as in a previous generation, we had an organized effort against the mob. We need to take these people on. They are often connected to big drug cartels. They are not just gangs of kids anymore. They are often the kinds of kids that are called super predators. No conscience, no empathy. We can talk about why they ended up that way, but first we have to bring them to heel. And the president has asked the FBI to launch a very concerted effort against gangs everywhere take back the streets. It doesn't matter whether or not the person that is accosting your son or daughter or my son or daughter, my wife, your husband, my mother, your parents, it doesn't matter whether or not they were deprived as a youth. It doesn't matter or not whether or not they had no background that enabled them to have to uh, become uh, uh, social, uh, become socialized into the fabric of society. It doesn't matter whether or not they're the victims of society. The end result is they're about to knock my mother on the head with a lead pipe, shoot my sister, beat up my wife, take on my sons. So I don't want to ask what made them do this. They must be taken off the street. Unless we do something about that cadre of young people, tens of thousands of them, born out of wedlock, without parents, without supervision, without any structure, without any conscience developing, because they literally, I yield myself three more minutes, because they literally have not been socialized, they literally have not had an opportunity we should focus on them now. By painting the state, particularly its urban and or poor areas as lawless dystopian hellscapes and the residents of those areas as being responsible for that condition, California and Ergo the Nation was able to not only justify the building of those prisons to keep the rest of us safe, but the draconian punitive measures like mandatory minimums and Cali's infamous three strikes policy to manufacture a population of primarily poor and colored people to fill them. The implication of this should be obvious, but the point I'm making is the feds are perfectly content with Netflix spoon feeding you the narrative that the prison industrial complex is largely the work of a handful of greedy corporatists exploiting a constitutional loophole to create its own modern slave population and something america loves to do is america i like to say america loves to um it, it 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 discards it discards in part it will criticize a part so that it can protect the whole so what it does is mm -hmm. america feeds again propaganda language it feeds its citizens the the private prison narrative so that people think private prison is bad because that is where there becomes a commodification of people's bodies and incentive to create a system that resembles slavery in a business meanwhile private prisons do exactly what public prisons do but if people believe you carve out a part to protect the whole the problem them is is private prisons then they they ultimately protect and they protect and they legitimize the need for this institution in and of itself and yeah companies like verizon ibm texas instruments boeing and a bunch of others have been and in some cases still are beneficiaries of that loophole but most inmates don't really do much in terms of labor besides sit around waiting for their parole hearing or appeal date in fact, according to prisonpolicyinitiative.org, only 7% of U.S. prisons are actually for-profit, and less than 1% of the incarcerated are employed by private companies, and another 6% by what's called state-owned correctional industries. Most of the work done by the incarcerated is just to keep the prison running, you know, things like doing laundry, cooking, cleaning, basically like in unpaid maid service. 
Another common belief we have to dispel is the idea that the PIC is slowing down for any reason other than a literal act of God or the devil, depending on how you want to look at it. This devil, to be specific. Incarceration rates did decrease during COVID lockdown, but not because of mass mass release of inmates violent or otherwise the way that mainstream media what have you believe in fact prisons are now releasing fewer people today as compared to pre-pandemic levels the precipitous drop in the prison population is due to a dramatic drop in new admissions which fell by 40 percent in 2020 and we're still down by 27 percent in 2021 this is due to a number of different factors, including delays in the court system, temporary suspension of transfers between local jails, and <laughs> you're not going to believe this one, an overall drop in the total crime rate. Yeah, somebody's got some heavy explaining to do. Despite the smaller populations, however, deaths in prison rose by 46% in 2020 and remained 25% above pre-pandemic levels in 2021. All deaths that were caused by COVID, obviously, and could have been avoided had prisons made even a halfway decent effort to release more inmates, according to the Bureau of Justice. Matter of fact, all signs seem to indicate that incarceration rates are creeping right back up to pre-pandemic levels, again, according to Prison Policy Initiative. And even after release, folks, that's just the beginning of sorrows for most ex-cons. Like I said earlier, depending on the severity of the offense, many ex-cons are disqualified from many forms of public aid on top of their employment opportunities being severely limited. For instance, certain drug offenders are disqualified from public housing despite all of the study that correlates access to housing with poverty, ergo potential criminality, Ergo, that vicious cycle that we talked about earlier, but whatever. It sounds too much like right to ever be considered by the feds, right? Okay, so let me make this personal for a second. Like I've said in the past, I've had my own run-ins with police, and none of them have been positive. The most recent of which I was arrested for. But, you see, here's the thing, folks. Of all the times I was stopped by police, this was probably the most needless one. Because, you see, I got arrested for riding a train without a ticket, of all things. An offense that in my state carries with it a maximum $100 fine. Which is exactly why if you ride the train every day like I was at the time, you don't pay to ride like the fine practically pays for itself after like three weeks or whatever the only reason i can figure why i was stopped that day is because i was the first nigga to get off and i noticed because one they were literally standing at the platform just waiting for the train to arrive and as far as i knew there were no disturbances or whatever that had occurred and two the only other person that got stopped was this little old black lady with one of those push laundry carts with a bunch of miscellaneous items in it so i'm saying y'all know what time it is you know what i got for that arrest a petty theft charge, which carried with it a maximum $2,500 fine and six months in jail. Again, we're talking about a $2 train ticket here. Now, full disclosure, I did have an outstanding warrant on me at the time from years earlier that I had completely forgotten about, but that was because I had missed a court date. It wasn't you know, me being criminal, just me being stupid, but moving on. I did wind up scraping some money together and hiring a lawyer who did get the thing reduced to like a disturbing the peace citation or something. And I 
walked away only having to pay like $400 in fines and court fees. But that's not really the important part. The important part here is that petty theft is what's called in New Jersey a disorderly person's offense. Basically, the equivalent of a misdemeanor anywhere else. That's a criminal charge, bucko. If you don't understand the implications of that, at the time I was enrolled in a postgraduate program, which means that had I been convicted, the next time I applied for aid, I probably wasn't going to qualify. I was also a public employee at the time, which meant that I'd have been disqualified from asking for student loan forgiveness once I did meet that 120 payment threshold, which I'm never going to get to at this point anyway. They can kiss my behind. Yeah. But the point is, had I been convicted on that charge, I wasn't going to be able to qualify for that. And more than likely, I was going to have to surrender my pension and possibly even my health insurance, which was the whole point of me even taking that job in the first place. And obviously, if this had all happened before I applied, I wasn't going to get that job, along with most other gainful employment opportunities. This doesn't even count the limits that would have been placed on my ability to travel, possibly to vote. And remember, at the end of the day, folks, what we're talking about here is a $2 train ticket. And listen, y'all can miss me with all that. Well, if you can't do the time, BS, because like we've already established, crime is literally nothing more than what the law says it is. And the law is not inherently just. Matter of fact, in a lot of cases, it is exactly the opposite of that. Remember, again, the purpose of the law is to maintain order so that commerce can run as undeterred as possible. There's practically speaking only one thing that determines what is lawful and what is not, and that is the interest of the state. And because, in theory at least, the state can't operate without the people's mandate, it's in the state's interest to follow the public zeitgeist if for no reason than to distract them from all the other shady stuff that they're doing behind the scenes. That's why it's illegal to terminate a pregnancy in some parts of the country. That's why buying cannabis just became legal in the majority of the U.S. less than a decade ago. That's why you literally cannot teach black history in Florida or you might go to jail for it only one of the many 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 reasons why florida is basically a meme well what about all of the rapists and pedos the murderers the arsonists waiting in the dark alley to take our lives and our bodies away from us billiam what about the so-called terrible few who are beyond rehabilitation well here's the thing about those folks most of the terrible few offenders don't ever actually see justice. While murder rates in the U.S. spiked until literally this year, the rate of those crimes that were actually solved, meaning someone was charged and convicted of committing that crime, hit an all-time low of 50% in 2020. Additionally, according to Rain, an organization that's dedicated to sex advocacy, out of every 1,000 sex offenders in the U.S., 975 of them walk free. What I'm saying is we're already in Gotham, folks. And Batman ain't coming anytime soon. Well, I, I, I mean, I'm, unless you're in... in Philly, obviously. Also, we have to clear up what a violent crime actually means in the context of the law. Violent crime doesn't necessarily mean you've done any physical harm to anyone or anything. In the public discourse, it's better to understand violent and nonviolent as serious and non serious, which itself is pretty misleading, but that's a whole nother topic for another day. We're just going to move on. For example, depending on what state you're in, things like purse snatching, stealing or manufacturing drugs, or just selling drugs too close to a school are considered violent offenses. 
in North Carolina, for example, embezzlement, trafficking of fake identities, and habitual breaking and entering, whatever that's supposed to mean, are all considered violent crimes. Burglary, which is generally considered a property crime, can be classified as violent depending on a number of different variables, like if a weapon was present during the incident or simply because the incident occurred at night. Like, I joke with you not. Even if there's no one in the building that you're breaking into, if you break into that building during Monday night football, you're likely to catch a more serious charge than if General Hospital was on. Quick editor's note is also pretty important to note that 50% of federal inmates are serving time because of a drug offense, violent or otherwise. So, yeah, just sort of keep that in the back of your mind to drive this point home as much as possible. All right, you can start it back up, Clarence. But again, we got to ask ourselves, why, though? Why does it at least feel like the justice system is going out of its way to incarcerate as many folks as they can justify? Why place such an unnecessary burden on not just the taxpayer, but the families of the incarcerated who spend time, effort, and money keeping their family member up, visiting them, accepting collect calls from them, putting money on their books and so forth? It doesn't make any sense. Like, are prisons that profitable? We invest $300 billion a year to fund prisons and policing every year. And this doesn't even include the burden placed on the families, which pushes that number up to something around $1 trillion plus dollars in total cost. Why? Well, it would be real easy, like beating the bears easy, for me to just end it right there and move on. But that's not even close to the whole story, folks. Buckle in because this is where this shit gets real diabolical. But of course, the real issue is that everybody understands whether you read the research or, research or not, everybody basically understands what is called crime is basically a, a, a really a measurement of the oppression in any community, the measurement of inequality mm -hmm. in any community. If you don't want so-called crime, you get rid of the inequality and most of the crime is going to go away between the crime that is based on material need, the crime that is based on the, the impact of a socialization in an unequal society, what is defined as crime, what is found to be criminal activity because you're only looking at one segment of the population. But if, if the goal ultimately is to engage in the wild exploitation that we see happening in this world, and from their perspective, it's get the guns, get the police, get the et cetera. So even in some of my own work, I've seen where the, the, the research showing that that billionaires are explicit in their concern, that from their perspective, they're like, look, we don't want to get rid of the inequality. We're quite happily, happily, you know, living off the labor of everyone else. But we still need that labor to be able to afford at least some of the products they're making and that make us rich. So if and and if we don't close some of that gap, that is, if if we don't allow for enough to trickle down for them to go shop and have vacations and do all this other stuff, uh, and ultimately keep the economy going, then they start looking at us. See, here's the thing about prisons: they don't really generate enough of a profit to be worth the money we invest in them. That said, they do address an even bigger fundamental problem with late stage capitalism that most of us don't really consider. According to Wilson, the real problem California and states like it were trying to solve by expanding their prison systems was not recovering revenue loss transitioning from industry to service but finding something to do, or more accurately, somewhere to put all this excess labor, AKA poor and unemployed people. What I'm saying is the real purpose of prisons in the US is not punishment. It's not rehabilitation, obviously, and it's not even profit, but it's population control for the most marginalized among us. 
because I talked about it in my video on mass incarceration, I'm not going to dwell here, but when the literal white devil gutted both California and later the country's mental health system, the first place that all those burdensome mental health patients who were too unwell to function in societies by themselves were sent was the jail. Again, like I said a year ago, Cook County Jail is effectively one big mental ward. The biggest one in the country at that. But y'all can go look all that up on your own time. What we really want to ask again is why, though? Why go through all these hoops, all this song and dance just to tiptoe around the real problem? The reason you, the feds, said yourself is why all those black, brown, and even poor white people are so miffed to begin with. When you could literally just divert all that money you spend on private military contracts and corporate subsidies every year and basically solve the problem tomorrow. Like, literally, you appointed a whole entire commission to figure this out, and they came back and said, if you just give niggas money, then they won't burn your stuff down. And y'all said, nah, nah, we, we, we good. Just find something else to do. Why? Well, the answer is Marxism. Okay, Marx bros, don't say that I've never done anything for you but here's the hood nigga version when you have an excess of labor in other words a bunch of broken jobless folk and they start talking cavorting and possibly swapping bodily fluids with each other something like this begins to happen hey man i just realized something we sitting here going back and forth on some trap shit but the same shit that keeping you broke is keeping me broke too fam Yo, dead ass, nigga. Dead ass. Why are we beefing with each other when we should be beating with them niggas over there? Matter of fact, you know what we should do? Like, like maybe niggas should... Yo, niggas should make like a broke nigga Voltron or some shit. You know, go straight Amistad out on these niggas. Like some real give us us free shit. Know what I mean? Bet, bet. Like on some Captain Planet shit. When, when our, our powers, powers combined, combined. <laughs> like I'm tweaking so hard right now, man. On God. And see, this is the unspoken purpose of police and prisons. To prevent conversations just like that from ever even having a chance to happen. Like that is the reason black power groups were and still are the primary targets of initiatives like Coento Pro. Black power groups like the BPP, the US Movement, and even street gangs like the Bloods, Crips, BDs, GDs, etc. were one, formed originally as a countermeasure to police brutality in poor, primarily urban communities of color, and two, composed primarily of that excess labor force we talked about earlier that also just so happens to have the most revolutionary potential. And like I said in the past, the more marginalized you are, the less likely you are to see the system as being flawed or broken, but being intentionally rigged against you, which it is. And thus your only real means of liberation is to revolt against it. And that is perhaps the worst lie that the U.S. education system has taught us. The civil rights and the black power movements didn't just end with MLK, who himself was harassed and terrorized by the feds and probably assassinated by them too, but we ain't gonna talk about that, that's a whole nother video. The stated goal of Coento Pro was to quote, disrupt, discredit, or otherwise neutralize primarily black revolutionaries. And in the process, they wiped out damn near an entire generation of radical black leaders. Oh. Policing is a white supremacist institution. Okay, all right. Yeah, like they can't infiltrate where they live at. That's their headquarters. Like it was made okay. for them. <laughs> the outlier, listen, at the end of the day, we know, you know, I always think it's funny because we know that the what these institutions do and that they're white supremacist institutions because anytime you see anybody try to make an example of what is a good one, a progressive mm -hmm. prosecutor or a good police, it is somebody fighting with their office. It is somebody trying to make the office do something it does not do. That right. period, always. And that usually ends in a degree of consequence. 
You see what I'm saying? But that is what a progressive prosecutor is someone who is trying to do something that the office doesn't do. They're trying to do something different. A good police, a, a whistleblower, the police, it is somebody who is trying mm -hmm. to do something against what is the practice of the bank. So what's the practice? So what's the practice? You see what I'm saying? Now, I was going to use this section to tell y'all the stories of people like Asada Shakur, Mumia Abu-Jamal, and George Jackson, but evidently Feek did that already. Gotcha, bitch! But because, again, I am petty like that, I'll do you one better, you son of a- uh, others have pointed out, I mean, there's a lot of good work that has come out over the years that have pointed also to the to a broader European imperial tradition where the police here are very much formed in the lineage of the British military. So a lot of what you see in the suppression of black and brown and working white people here in this country emanates from an ethic that originates in the, the European, the British imperial design to suppress, to suppress their colonized communities, starting with the Irish and, and others. So there is this, this relationship. So then finally, as Malcolm X used to say, the police do locally what the military does internationally. Definitely counter-revolutionary, but I also argue counter community because it's not just about revolution but it's about the ability for people to come together and have uh be able to pull away from the state itself right because historically communities uh were autonomous right even under mm -hmm. governance right you supplied to all your own needs you looked out for all your own people you did all your own you did all your own policing and consequences or whatever right and so that doesn't really work for like an industrialized state. And so mm -hmm. they've at least evolved into the the point of making sure that they have the hegemony on violence force. And we are like, um, not only not revolting, but also um, that we do not become too strong of communities that can pull away from it just by just general, general divestment. Reason mm -hmm. the white supremacists, the fascists um, are so easily infiltrated, the police infiltrate is, it's infiltrate, right? Because it's not really yeah, infiltrate. Yeah. It's those things were foundational. Like we talk about the police, the Ku Klux Klan was foundational to the existence of the present police. Like literally foundational. They were the slave patrols that these police were based off of, right? The same tactics they use in slave patrols are the same tactics they use now. So one of the things is ideologically they're on the same plane. So for fascists to join and, and right and the alt right to join police is like a given, right? We well, one of the first videos I did on this channel that I actually mentioned earlier was about how despite the mythology, the feds never actually stopped surveilling and sabotaging groups it believed to be threats to national security. And by national security, I really mean the interest of rich white neolibs. So what if I told you that since 2013, the FBI has been actively surveilling Black Lives Matters protests and even the homes and vehicles of several Black Lives Matter activists. Because according to the feds, wherever there is a group of three or more black people assembled in a public place, something criminal is likely to ensue. At least according to the leaked FBI emails that says that as well as the BLM activists planning to possibly co-opt the 2016 Democratic National Convention Committee, I don't know for freak nick or something whatever the wild part is there is nothing in those documents that would indicate that the surveilled activists would be planning any criminal or violent acts considering that according to the fbi databases none of those individuals had a criminal record at the time of surveillance in fact earlier this year unsealed court documents revealed that the feds had abused section 702 of the 2008 FISA Amendments Act to conduct almost 300,000 warrantless inquiries on 19,000 individuals between 2016 and 21. Among them, political donors, social activists, and the inbred trailer hicks who took part in the most pathetic collective temper tantrum in American history. It's like a living allegory for impotent white rage. Okay, he, he is also, but y'all get my point. But the feds illegally surveilling black people without probable cause shouldn't come as a surprise unless your name is Patrick Starr. Especially if you've seen the leaked FBI counterterrorism guide, which lists black identity extremists. 
as a higher threat to national security than white supremacists and freaking Al Qaeda. TLDR, what the feds decided was to justify the illegal surveillance and harassment of black identity activists by drawing lines between several unrelated incidents of violence toward police committed by black people over the course of the preceding decade or so, including the Micah Xavier Johnson incident from 2016 that I talk all about in that video I mentioned earlier. So yeah, the feds cooked up a whole conspiracy theory just to terrorize black people in American tradition. See, the thing is, instances of racially motivated violence committed by black people against law enforcement is so rare that it's almost always just lumped in with broader left-wing identity extremist violence, which itself accounts for only one-fourth of all socio-politically motivated violence against police. Like, literally, the biggest threat to police, aside from COVID and Krispy Kreme, is white people. But don't tell the cops that. Then they'll actually have a reason to hold themselves accountable for once. Oh, y'all y'all didn't know this? Unlike the super predator narrative that neolibs cooked up to justify the ever-expanding prison industrial complex, the feds have had concerns going back at least to crank that of white supremacists and their sympathizers infiltrating local law enforcement. Matter of fact, one heavily redacted document obtained by The Intercept in 2017 stated, quote, domestic terrorism investigations focused on militia extremists, white supremacist extremists, and sovereign citizen extremists often have identified active links to law enforcement officers. Not shocking at all, considering infiltration of law enforcement is a prominent plot point in a lot of white supremacist fiction, including stuff like the Turner Diaries and Hunter, which both serve as something like a insurgency for dummies handbook for white supremacy sympathizers. Despite this very open secret being so open is practically common knowledge at this point, Advocates have long lambasted U.S. law enforcement agencies for turning a willful blind eye to white supremacists within their ranks. In fact, a 2020 report given by former Fed himself, Michael German, and published by the Brennan Center for Justice, states that multiple officers in at least 14 U.S. states have been exposed for alleged ties to white supremacists and right-wing extremist groups since 2000 while hundreds of officers have been caught expressing racist, xenophobic, misogynistic, or otherwise problematic views on social media. Now, the irony is that despite the feds acknowledging, according to that 2017 report I mentioned earlier, that despite the FBI's concerns over white supremacist, quote, historical interest in infiltrating local law enforcement, the feds only recently acknowledged white supremacy as the biggest domestic terror threat in the U.S., saying that white supremacists account for the, quote, biggest chunk of extremist-related violent incidents. This coming a few years after the feds abandoned the BIE and WSE designations in favor of the umbrella term racially motivated violent extremists and public pressure to nix the DIE designation altogether the problem is again black identity extremist violence is so rare it might as well be a three stacks lp but according to that same counter terror guide book black identity rmbes were a quote elevated and white supremacy rmbes were a quote medium threat despite again the feds own two decade old anxiety of local law agencies turning into clan clubhouses and this doesn't even account for the false equivalency made between the two RMVE designations according to the guy's own language. But I'm not getting into that. Again, there's a whole video that I did on it. My point is both local and federal law enforcement have a big fat blind spot when it comes to white supremacy with the local agencies, sometimes willingly facilitating their own infiltration. And the feds having nary the slightest clue of it until it's already too late to matter anyway. I used to subscribe to a newsletter that covered this. Uh, so I'm probably a little bit out of date. But but in general, there are 
hundreds, if not thousands of, of white supremacist formations in the United States of all, all form and variety that are monitored and are concerned by those who rule the United States. Not so much because those who are in power in the United States are wanting to eradicate white supremacy and bring about an egalitarian world, but because they're concerned about what what groups and formation, forms, formations might emerge that would threaten the stability of the country and the 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 general flow of business. So in other words, the society, uh, capitalism has no problem on the one hand, will happily create a, a, even a white underclass uh, that is is impoverished and, and oppressed and exploited. There is a desire among those in power historically to, to not only create this white underclass, but to also assure that the negative or the unhappy or the 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 criticism that emerges from that community does not become itself truly left and revolutionary, i.e. socialist, communist, uh, um, and other varieties of, of radical left formations, but that becomes angry and narrow nationalistic and uh, uh, extremely white supremacist and ultimately targeting uh, a, a vague state formation that is itself taken over by the so-called mud people, black, brown, and Jews, right? <laughs> okay, so for y'all who watched the COINTELPRO video a while back, this section, and honestly the one before it, is going to feel a lot like deja vu, but I feel like it was important to include this because folks need to understand the entire thesis statement behind this video, literally the point for me making it, is to get y'all to understand something. COINTELPRO never died. It just evolved. Clarence, I'm trying to be ominous here. Jesus. In 2016, Elijah Juan Ali Davis, along with Brandon Orlando Baldwin, was sentenced to seven years in prison after pleading guilty to four separate gun and explosives charges in relation to an alleged plot to both assassinate the St. Louis chief of police and head prosecutor, as well as blow up the St. Louis Arch, a.k.a. the world's largest septum piercing. Here's the thing, though. Those of y'all from around that way are probably thinking, wait, the arch is just about impossible to get that close to. And yeah, the feds basically said as much after this incident, citing the airport level security at the St. Louis Arch. More conspicuous than that, however, even after his release, Davis maintained that he never had any plans to actually carry out that plan. And more importantly, that the plan was never his to begin with. And so uh, one of those conversations happened with a, uh, a quote unquote friend of the family, somebody who I had known before Ferguson back in my youth, um, they were the first to come and give an invitation to help them buy weapons. Actually, in tandem with that, having an individual come in who I did not know at all, they gave me an apartment, gave me money, you know, I mean, everything that you would want a friend to do, you know. But then right after that, they also became involved with asking and encouraging me to be involved with their uh, criminal activity as far as purchasing weapons and um, which I had participated in I helped them and once the transaction happened I was um, arrested and accused of trying to kill prosecuting attorney kill government officials and above all blow up the arch never planned to hurt anybody I was acting as a middleman very much so I had one confidential informant on my left, who was the friend of the family, who uh, made the claim that he had the access to these weapons. And then I had the other confidential informant on, the, on my right, who was requesting and wanting these things. So they were playing me in the middle. So I would be basically getting it for one person, one from one informant and providing it to the next one. I initially had no intentions on pleading guilty. I was intending on going to trial and fighting for my innocence. Um, but again, it was clear that I was not on the winning side. And it would be my burden to prove that I had no intentions to do any of these things and that, that I was entrapped. And that's very hard to do when you have no money 
and you have no um, representation who's willing to go all the way for you. So I knew that I was already uh, in a losing battle. So it was a tough decision to make, but it's like, hey, seven years versus the, the potential for a 30 year minimum sentence or life, you know? So you have to play chess and you have to make the best decision. Now y'all might be sitting here thinking that this is all here saying it kind of is but remember this is basically the same testimony that those white nationalist numbskulls who plotted to kidnap the governor of michigan a while ago gave as well matter of fact in both these cases it was revealed that the informants were being reimbursed and further compensated beyond that for driving these plots along including doing things like paying for any materials like vehicles and lodgings to strengthen the cases against the accused. An informant can earn $100,000 or more for every terrorism case they bring to the FBI. That's right, the FBI is paying mostly criminals and con men six figures to spy on communities in the United States, but mostly Muslim American communities. These informants nab people like Abu Khalid Abdul Latif and Wali Mujahid. Both are mentally ill. Abdul Latif had a history of huffing gasoline and attempting suicide. Mujahid had schizoaffective disorder. He had trouble distinguishing between reality and fantasy. In 2012, the FBI arrested these two men for conspiring to attack a military recruiting station outside Seattle with weapons provided, of course, by the FBI. The FBI's informant was Robert Childs, a convicted rapist and child abuser who was paid $90,000 for his work on the case. This isn't an outlier. In 2009, an FBI informant who had fled Pakistan on murder charges led four men in a plot to bomb synagogues in the Bronx. The lead defendant was James Cromedy, a broke Walmart employee with a history of mental problems. And the informant had offered him $250,000 if he participated in that plot. There are many more examples. Today, The Intercept published my new story about a counterterrorism sting in Tampa involving Sammy Osmakash, a young man who was living near Tampa, Florida. Osmakash also had schizoaffective disorder. He too was broke, and he had no connections to international terrorist groups. Nonetheless, an FBI informant gave him a job, handed him money, introduced him to an undercover agent posing as a terrorist, and lured him in a plot to bomb an Irish bar. But here's what's interesting. The lead undercover agent, you can see him in this picture with his face blurred, would go back to the Tampa field office with his recording equipment on. Behind closed doors, FBI agents admitted that what they were doing was farcical. A federal judge doesn't want you to hear about these conversations. He sealed the transcripts and placed them under a protective order in an attempt to prevent someone like me from doing something like this. Behind closed doors, the lead agent, the squad supervisor, described their would-be terrorist as a retarded fool who didn't have a pot to piss in. They described his terrorist ambitions as wishy-washy and a pipe dream scenario. But that didn't stop the FBI. They provided Sammy Osvakash everything he needed. They gave him a car bomb. They gave him an AK-47. They helped him make a so-called martyrdom video. And they even gave him money for a taxi cab so he could get to where they wanted him to go. As they were working the sting, the squad supervisor tells his agents he wanted a Hollywood ending. And he got a Hollywood ending. When Sammy Osvakash attempted to deliver what he thought was a car bomb, he was arrested, convicted, and sentenced to 40 years in prison. Sammy Osmakash isn't alone. He's one of more than 175 so-called terrorists for whom the FBI has created Hollywood endings. Okay, so yeah, that's another can of worms that I'm not even going to try to open up in this video. But the point that y'all need to get here is that the feds have a demonstrable pattern of literally creating their own worst enemies i don't know for what reason to justify their existence or funding or whatever my point being that they're nowhere above entrapping folks for the sake of fulfilling their own means now why would the feds go out of their way to entrap davis of all people you might ask well, firstly, Davis was head of his local New Black Panther Party chapter at the time, which, I mean, doesn't count for much in the context of this story since that org has 
basically no affiliation with the OG BPP. But I think it's interesting to note that Davis was registered as a Moorish citizen, which to y'all that don't know, is basically what Kyrie would be if he were really about that action. Which also, by all accounts, Davis displayed enough charisma and leadership that he wound up becoming president of that chapter after literally like a week of being a member. And I mean, if you know how decentralized that org is, that's really not that surprising, honestly. So yeah, what I'm saying is this is exactly the type of dude that the feds both fear and what want to make an example out of. But that's not even the scariest part, folks. No, because these niggas are bold enough now that what for the past like 10 years or so they've been doing to black radicals in the dark they're not doing it in broad day like the ish is legal. Because, I mean, who's going to stop them? Earlier this month, it was revealed that over 60 dissidents were indicted on a Georgia State RICO charge for their attempts to stop the building of the Atlanta Public Safety Center, colloquially known as Cop City. Now, if you're watching this video, I'm assuming that you're woke enough to know what cop city is and why it's very 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 bad so i'm not going to dwell but what i really want y'all to do is to just sit there and think about the implications of this for a second what we're talking about here is a five to twenty year bid for at worst what doing damage to state property and in some of these people's cases according to their own testimony at least they weren't even active participants. They literally just so happened to be in the same area in which the demonstrations were taking place. Like one of the accused was a legal advisor that was just observing the happenings going on. Like you could literally just so happen to be dozy doing through the woods and come across a peaceful protest and boom, you caught a Rico nigga. I also want y'all to take into consideration for a second, the unspoken goal of a lot of RICO cases. Remember, this statute was originally put in place to go after organized crime enterprises like the mob. In a lot of cases, what the feds are really trying to do is scare at least one nigga with enough time in the folding and flipping on the whole rest of the crew. Like, practically speaking, that's what happened in the Treyway case with 6 9 and it's what seems to be happening in the YSL trial. I really don't know or care that much to do enough research on it, but I'm assuming that that's kind of how that thing is shaking out. Like, think about if they had had this statue back in the 60s. They really wouldn't have had a need, practically speaking, for Coento Pro. Like, all you have to do is gather enough evidence of Black Panther Party members committing illegal acts in a coordinated manner. Like, I don't know, buying and openly carrying arms after the Mulford Act was passed. And then you get one of those guys or gals in the room, get them to fold, and the whole house comes tumbling down. Again, think about what that means for protest and peaceful dissent going forward. Usually I try to avoid hyperbolic statements like, we're living in an Orwell novel, but nigga, we're kind of living in an Orwell novel. Like, don't get it twisted. Regardless of how this thing does shake out in the end, the message has been sent loud and clear. If you stand against the state, you will be punished. I mean, unless you're any of these idiots, obviously. He never got the talk, obviously. That's, that's kind of my point. Okay, so I'm going to be real with y'all. After I watched Unk's video, I did struggle a little bit to figure out what was even the point of this one because it's basically just the Cliff Notes version of that. <laughs> but then I had a seat in my thinking chair and began asking myself the same question I've been asking both myself and y'all throughout the course of this video. Why though? Why did I even make this video? Why did any of the people who dropped police or prison videos over the last few months or so 
even bother. I mean, Unk stated his goal from jump, but that's kind of the issue, right? Why do you need him? Why do you need me? Why do you need any of us to make a video on this topic for you to pay attention to it? Listen, I know this comes off as abrasive, but that's why y'all love me in the first place. So shut up and take the medicine. I've said this several times since I've entered this online space that content is not praxis. More specifically, the consumption of it is not praxis. Understand, this isn't meant as any shade to philosophy tube or Big Joel or FD, I guess. Because honestly, if it weren't for those platforms and they caring enough about these issues to make content about it, a lot of y'all wouldn't know or frankly care about them. Okay, so y'all that follow this channel closely know that since I've started offering a particular perk to patrons, a very small but vocal minority of people have started whining about me gatekeeping information from them, which is stupid in a vacuum, but let's just humor this idea for a moment. What exactly is in those sources that y'all need that desperately? Confirmation of the claims that I've made today? Resources to use for your own project? Or maybe you genuinely do just want the nitty gritty nasty details of everything that I presented to you. Honestly, any of those reasons is a valid one. I'm not even going to lie. But my question is, how are you, the viewer, going to apply any of the information that I or anyone else has given you to a real world solution to the issues that have been brought to light in this and other videos? How much confirmation, how much more reaffirmation of these issues, the fact that they exist and the fact that they are happening in broad day, do you need before you decide to act? How many more videos do you need to watch before you finally move? Again, the consumption of content, whether it's a YouTube video, a scholarly journal entry, a book on theory, a firsthand account, an empirical study, just straight up raw data on the subject, is not praxis. Listen, let me make it clear here. I'm by no means advocating for violence against person or property by any means. You got that, Jeffrey? But what I am saying is, this is kind of what happens when rich kids are left to lead the revolution, isn't it? They lose the plot. They become so preoccupied with making things make sense that those things wind up never getting done at all or they morph into something completely alien from what they were initially meant to be. That's what happened with Woke. That's what happened with Black Lives Matters. That's what happened with Dare I Say Me Too and Say Her Name. Once certain people got a hold of those phrases and the corresponding movements behind them, they, whether purposefully or inadvertently, co-opted it and wound up losing the plot to the point that the people that those movements were originally designed to uplift and strengthen the causes that were meant to be highlighted by those movements were kind of cast by the wayside. That's my problem with ACAB. It's basically this. Nigga, did you just say what I was trying to say, but smarter? What I'm saying is it's what privileged people say to make FTP make sense for themselves. But listen, the people who are truly impacted by the inherent danger presented by police and the PIC don't need to be told that all cops, regardless of whether they are inherently bad people themselves, are still complicit in an unjust system. Much less do they need that message to be watered down as to attract otherwise reticent allies. This is how defund the police somehow became reform the police and ultimately became do jack all about them that's the point i'm trying to make here folks the things that a lot of us have just begun to make sense relative to our own privileged existences is what folks in the trenches have been putting into practice for at least as long as i've been alive and they are the people who not only need to be platformed but given the reins if we're really going to turn this conversation into practical application when people when you say 
you know, abolition, people say, well, well, what are we going to do about crime if we don't have this system? And I want to say this, we don't have anything that we do about crime. The system that we have here is not meant to address crime. In fact, it is meant to reproduce it because it's a business. Mm -hmm. There's a reason why we are keeping these kinds of things, the same kind of communities down. The reality is poverty, poverty is what leads to crime, right? And 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 they know. The mm -hmm. thing is, people ask you, oh, what are you going to do? As though it's some mythical, it's some mythical, fanciful thing. Like, well, I would do the same thing they're doing in the communities that they don't police this way. They don't treat every, this is not the experience of everybody. That is not white people and rich people and well-to-do people are not policing their communities like that. You know what their communities have that ours don't have? resources and they know that they know that the response to it is not criminalization that is not what's going to help us the the only thing i'm confident in is that we need to adjust our understanding of what the police are what crime is and how society works so that if we want uh to 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 have a society in a world where we don't live as we do now we're going to have to get more involved and more active and and in many ways more militant in in developing an alternative and assuming political power because ultimately that's what i'm are arguing for that it is uh and i don't mean democrat republican i mean true political power the ability to define how society is run as was as 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 huey newton and them used to say to define phenomena and have it act in a, in a desired manner we need to, to and to do that we really need to increase our our levels of organization our support for grassroots movements and and alternative outlets in terms of media and news how we get there i really think is ultimately for off air off record conversations that involve yeah, yeah, politically yeah. organized people but 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 that's really it i think when people have a degree of privilege say middle class and up um um they are div they are divorced from the situations that are actually happening inside the streets or the hood or mm -hmm. or the bottoms because they don't actually live that reality. And so not only they're propagandized, but they also have an interest in the current system. And the current system says, oh, you we got to protect you from them because we got to protect your property, which is half true, not from us, but we got to protect your property, right? Because mm -hmm. the thing is, if we look, especially in America, for equitable uh, outcome to the resources we have, then a lot of people's property would be in jeopardy, not because um, somebody would come steal it from them, but because it literally is made off the backs of people at the bottom. And so we'll talk about redistribution of wealth. And I think part of keeping you in the interest of the state is keeping you in fear of how that redistribution would happen. Fundamentally, um, if we're talking about within the capitalist construct, I think resources being put in communities that don't have them is is primary, and that will deal with a lot of the situations we're dealing with. There will always be a few outlier situations that are not about those economics, but they're really rare when you think about fundamentally the, the prison industrial complex and the police. But also, if it's people from our community who is doing this, the... Uh, the security and defense then they will understand our community understand what's going on the dynamics with right them. each of the guests i chose to interview for this video i did so because they have in one capacity or another done the work i believe necessary to be considered someone to turn to on these sorts of issues dr ball has researched and written at length on the oft unspoken history of black radical politics that's often either watered down or dismissed altogether in favor of that kumbaya bs they teach you about the civil rights movement in middle school Oleyemi is a public defender like she literally sees everything that i've talked about today unfold in real time on a day-to-day -day basis and even produce her own content talking about it bp is actually the person a lot of y'all pretend to be behind the cover of your anime profile picture not only is bp about that action but they have been victimized by the predatory u.s justice system and have for at least as long as i've known them worked to organize the trenches into a revolutionary force and yet none of those platforms has the amount of subscribers that even i have a medium-sized youtube channel let alone someone as big as fd signifier or big joel or philosophy tube and all the other big creators who have done these types of videos 
John Lewis is another friend of the channel who spent years organizing in the trenches before even making an upload. He did a whole hour long video like four or five months ago giving you everything you need to know about the prison system and why it is an infected penis. And it has like 10,000 views. You starting to see the issue here? These are the people that need to be in the front as well as a bunch of people who won't ever write a book on these topics or record a video for y'all's consumption because they're too busy down there getting it out the mud. But people should check out the work of Leaders of a Beautiful Struggle, of the All-African People's Revolutionary Party, of community movement builders in Atlanta and elsewhere, of uh, Black Alliance for Peace, uh, uh, the you know uh, Pan-African Community Action. Uh, these and other organizations are really doing uh, uh, the 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 heavy lifting in grassroots work. Black Lives Matter, the DC chapter. You know that not not the foundation, not the not the celebrity stuff, but some of the folks doing. You know, like that that they are really doing this heavy lifting yeah, work yeah. in communities. That's those are the spaces that need to be lifted up and joined and supported, uh, and where the real answers to that, particularly that last question, will come. Now, listen, I'll be the first to admit that I I ain't that nigga, at least not not anymore. I'm not. I am a certified suburbaner now. Like this morning, I had locks, chive cream cheese, and capers on a toasted everything bagel. Capers, nigga. So I choose to use my platform to platform them instead. It's wild because these terms that I wasn't introduced to until I entered these online spaces, these predominantly white online spaces like restorative and transformative justice or community resolutions. These concepts that I've seen presented as largely hypothetical or at best nascent, at least within the spaces I just mentioned, we were doing that for practically my whole life growing up. We just didn't have a name for it. Okay, so in another video I plan on doing toward the end of this year, I talk briefly about the concept of hood justice. Basically, the way it works is, if you kick my dog, then I'll kill your cat. Those are the unwritten rules of rap. The important thing to consider here is why does hood justice even exist in the first place? Well, it's because for one reason or another, you can't trust the police to involve them in your interpersonal affairs. That's why. Matter of fact, there's a non-zero chance that if you do call the police, they're going to wind up turning that badge on you at some point. This is why where and when I grew up, we largely handled our own affairs and even turned to the community to resolve them when needed. Okay, so let me give you all an example of what I'm talking about. Almost about a year ago now, a couple of boys from around the neighborhood broke into my church and tried to steal some snacks from out of the food pantry. What they didn't know was that we had just installed a new security system and there was somebody already on the grounds that day. So when the alarm did go off and they tried to book it out of there, the kids got stopped by that person. But instead of they calling the cops, they called their parents and wound up making an arrangement where the boys wound up working in the pantry for like six weeks or so every Thursday after school. And the whole neighborhood made sure that they were never late and never skipped a day. And honestly, this was a pretty common practice that I saw black and Latino shop owners using when I was a kid. Well, I mean, I think when it comes down to it, I think as far as like actual stopping harm or threats while they happen, I think, uh, community uh security teams or uh defense teams are always been a part of human culture right like until the police was invented as the construct and even still then we talk about a lot of communities it still is right we still look out for each other i think a lot of it just comes out for looking out for each other in the first place mm -hmm. what i'm saying is the revolution is not online it never has been and it never will be frankly it's in the places where the most marginalized among us reside. And so if you really do want to fight the power, what I'm saying is you got to be down there where the power is being fought or at the very least do what's in your capacity to help those down there who are doing the things that 
we either don't have the capacity to do or frankly a lot of us don't have the heart to by the time this video gets uploaded you'll have seen like I don't know how many prison and police abolition videos but my point is you should be fully deprogrammed from all things propaganda by this point but just knowing that policing is a much bigger problem in the US than most people realize is frankly not enough again what are you going to do about it I mean if you really want to do something to help along with following the people that I mentioned earlier you can also look into organizations like the Marshall Project the prison policy initiative that I mentioned earlier black pink along with a bunch of others that escape my mind right now I'll leave the links to a few pretty good organizations down in the description below along with some other folks I think that y'all should probably follow but with that being said again <laughs> me giving you these resources other folks giving you these resources you absorbing all of this information hours and hours upon hours of content you gotta ask yourself am i really about that action or is this just another retweet like i said earlier i i ain't the one to ask again capers nigga Let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go.